Okay, so, so today we have come to the final message of First and Second Timothy. And I, I don't know about you, but throughout the year, this will be the close of our pulpit teaching series. So we, as you remember, we started with the book of Ruth, all right? And then we went on to the Luke series, Luke's Gospel, and then we went on the First and Second Timothy. And so that's the close of the pulpit teaching for this year. Next year, we'll be doing some Old Testament books. I'll let you know later on, beginning in January, what we'll be doing. That's our strength in this church. We go through the Bible, books, and there's so much to learn. And I don't know about you, I benefited so much from it. Have you benefited from the public teaching? Come on, show us a hand. Show me. Just, just encourage us. Thank you so much. We have prepared ourselves, and we are... Come on, let's give what a clap offering. It's been wonderful. It's very good spiritual feeding. So today... I'm going to share on a message entitled Terrible Times in the Last Days taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and I did 2 Timothy chapter 4 two weeks ago. Now, where did I get this title from? Well, from the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 begins like this. Mark this. Paul says, mark this. In other words, there is an emphatic imperative. Take note. Pay attention. There will be terrible times in the last days. One version has it. Know this. Another version says, realize this. The Bahasa Bible says, ketahuilah bahwa pada akhir zaman akan datang suatu masa yang sukar. Perilous times. Difficult times. And I have a great sense that it is actually happening today. Difficult times. We have not yet seen the aftermath of the wars that are still ongoing today. We don't know what the repercussions will be. But believe me, I think 2024 may not be that easy. Difficult times. So Paul wants us beforehand, mark this. There will be difficult times in the last days. And immediately I ask the question, for whom? For whom? And the answer I got from the Bible, for Christians. For Christians, I don't want to make this very clear. I'll say, why do I say that? Because if you look at the preceding verses in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul, all the time, were addressing Christians. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. He's talking about who? The Lord's servant. In a large house, verse 20, there are articles. Which house? House of God. And then in verse 14, so on, when what warned them before God against quarreling for each other. In other words, he was addressing Christians, and there were no chapters in the early days, and so he's still talking to Christians. Still talking to Christians. They will be terrible times, my friends, to you and to me in the last days. Why so? Why so? Because as I prepared this message, just only on Thursday, I read this passage several times. Actually, it is getting more and more difficult to become a good Christian nowadays, you know. I don't know about you. 
especially those of you who are working in the workplace. So hard, right? So much challenges going on, so much distractions, so much issues to face. And I will tell you why these are terrible times in a lot of days in a short while. But let's read. Let's read. In the last days, there will be terrible times. Paul says, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Remind you, uh, addressing Christians. Uh, I mean, it's very clear at the outset because of the context of what Paul is writing within the church. You see, when, when the church meets challenges outside, it actually is quite, not say easy, it's easier. Why? Because you identify the enemy. Ma. It's like the Israelites. It's very hard to fight. Why? Because they're in tunnels. If it's open warfare, it is okay, easier. But where they're in tunnels, you don't know where they are. You know, many Christians are hiding in tunnels within the church. That's why I make it so difficult. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive. And you would have thought that this is a description of people outside. No. No. That's why it's terrible. Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, and we sang just now, holy, holy. We sing only, ma. And yet in the last days, Paul says, within the church, Christians are unholy. Unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying His power, have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always like that. They are always learning. But they've never come to acknowledge the truth. You know how many Christians are like that? They're always learning. You cannot say that they're not hungry for God. They are. But like water on a duck's back, the truth just skims the, off their backs. They're always learning but never acknowledge the truth. Just as Janice and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men oppose the truth. Why? Because it's uncomfortable. Men of depraved minds who as far as our faith is concerned are rejected. But they will not get very far because as in the case of these men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Janice and Jambres traditionally are the names of the magicians in Moses, at the post-Moses in Pharaoh's court. In other words, the whole thing is spiritual. It is spiritual. So I'm going to share with you under two broad headings. First of all, why terrible? What's going to happen? That Paul says, terrible times. And more importantly, how do we overcome and emerge victorious? Why terrible? What's going to happen in the last days, and as I said earlier, is happening today as I speak? Four things. Four reasons Paul writes in this passage why these are terrible times, because these four things will happen and is already happening today. Believe me. Number one, there will be a great dilution 
in our spirituality. 19 things Paul wrote, negative things of Christians. 19 or one nine no. 19 characteristics of Christians within the church that will happen in the last days. There will be an absolute gradual, maybe, decline of spirituality in the church of Jesus Christ. I, I travel extensively. I, I could have, but I, I, I limit my travel. But even then, I, I get invited to speak to, to churches uh, all over Malaysia and elsewhere. And believe me when I say this, Sometimes I go to a church that I have been several years ago or last few years ago or a couple of years back or just one year ago and I can sense that the spiritual atmosphere of that church has gone down. I know. I know that. Something in my spirit tells me that this seems to be the trend nowadays in a lot of churches. Don't believe me? Look at the church in the West. Am I speaking the truth? And I want to believe that this will not happen in SIBKL. I want to believe that this will not happen here. That as we now go on and on and on and on, the spirituality will not go down, but will not even remain stagnant, but it will go up. Do you agree with me or not? You agree with me? Say a loud Amen. It should go up, right? Not go down, right? But... The trend nowadays, more so in the West, but coming to Asia, is that there is a sharp decline in the spiritual depth of Christians in the church. That's sad. That's very, very, very sad. Why? Why? And the key is this. Love. The word love occurs six times in four verses. I saw it. Verse 2 to verse 4 says this. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Love, 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 love. Six times. In other words, it ranges from no love to lovers of other things. In other words, the key is, it's not that you don't love God, you love wrong things. The love of God has been replaced by other loves. So if you ask me, why, Pastor? Why is it that in the last days, spirituality has declined in a lot of churches in Malaysia? I would say, I don't care, I don't know about other countries. Why? Because there is a lack of love for the Lord. We love so many things. You know, I was a doctor before, right? All of you know that. So I look again and I say, the right diagnosis, the accurate assessment of the, of the, of the health of the church is this. It's not that we don't love God. All of us love God. There's nobody here who don't love God. If you don't love God, you won't be here. We all love God. But we love God together with other loves. On the same par as we love the world. That's the problem. The issue among Christians today is that we love God among other loves. But the injunction of the Lord is that we must love God above other loves. That's the challenge. And that's where we feel. When we love God among other loves, before long, other loves will take over the love of God. You always hear me say this, and I say this again and again and again. 
your love for God must be number one. Your love for God must be number two. Your love for God must be number three. You cannot love God first, love family number two, love church third. Why? Because if you do that, your second one will overtake the first one before long. Before long, number three will overtake number one. But when you love God first, second and third, nobody, nothing will take the place of God. You must love God above other loves. Then only. You will not fade away. It's a challenge. Listen to me very carefully. Terrible times in the last days. And more and more people are succumbing to it. You've heard this quoted many times, especially when we did Luke this year. Jesus says, and this is taken from Deuteronomy, you know, not taken, it's not the scribes and the Pharisees, they knew what Jesus was talking about when Jesus quote this. It was quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema. This is part of the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, Jesus says. Come on, read this with me. I know, I know this holding blocks it, huh? but can you read it? Can you see it? All right, can you read windows on the balcony? It's the, it's the best seats. All right, the best view, honestly. All right, everybody read left to right, front to back. Are you ready? Read with me what Jesus says. One, two, three. With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, first and greatest commandment. If Jesus says this is the first and greatest commandment, there is no other commandment. Correct or not? If He says that this is number one, this is number one, not number two. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But you say, Pastor, what do I get out of it? When you put it, the love of God first, you remember Matthew 6, 33? What does Matthew 6, 33 say? Correct. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And, and, what, and what else? What else? All these things. Do you believe it or not? See? You seek first. God says you put me first. And believe me, I have experienced this in my own life. Many times. When you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, God will add on to you many things that money cannot buy. Believe me. Put God first. And in the book of Revelations, in Jesus' letter to the church of Ephesus, there were so many good things about that church. Your hard work, your good deeds, you persevere, you endured hardships. But Jesus says, I have this against you. You know, Jesus will probably have said this to many churches today. And I hope not to SIBKL. You have lost your first love. It's never about programs. It's never about doing things excellently. Never, even though it's important. Very important, we must do things well. But the key is, why do you do this? Do you do this because you love God? You know, Pastor Lee Chiu and I were just talking. I can't remember when. Was it yesterday? Just yesterday. In the 29 years that I have led SIBKL, going to 30 years next year, one of the things that kept us going all these years, we searched our heart a lot of times. Do I really love God? And I can say to you, unapologetically, both Pastor Nietzsche and I love God. We love Him. That's why the church is what it is today, my friend. Listen to me very carefully. You do it because you love God. 
Six times. Love is there. But the key is, what do you love? What do you love? The second thing that happens in the terrible days, in the last days, terrible times in the last days, is not only will there be a great decline in our love for Jesus, but also there will be a great deficit in the character that we have. 19 things, all negative ones, brutal, la, slanderous, la, conceited, la, rash, la, etc., 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 etc. In Christians. And yet the world look at Christians and we are supposed to manifest and express Jesus in our lives. What kind of a Jesus do we express? There's a great deficit in Christ's likeness more and more today. Wow. And that's very important. Very, very important. I look at this list. Proud, boastful, abusive, without love, unholy, unforgiving, no self-control, not lovers of the good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. In another form, lovers of money, not lovers of God. And if, if you ask me, look, people have accused me of being, you're anti-rich. I'm not anti-rich. But I know from the Bible, it's one thing, one single thing that will, that will remove a Christian from the church and from loving God is the mammon God. You know, that is the only God named by Jesus in the New Testament. Mammon. Believe me, I've seen enough. Other things may be, but when it comes to money, many Christians pursue money more than pursue God and they make use of the name of God. It is true, lovers of money. That's sad. That is so sad. I, I don't want to dwell so much on this, but I want to give you the antithesis. In other words, what do we need to counter all these negative things? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Come, read again. Read this with me. It's okay read this with me? So let's not focus on the negative things. It's okay with you? All right? Let's focus on things that the Lord wants us to do rather than what we don't have. All right? So let's, let's, let's read this. We are Christians. In SIBKL, we want to be more and more Christ-like. Now, we are not perfect, all right? But we want to be more and more like Jesus. Amen? So we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 is this. Now, read with me. Are you ready? All right. In the last days, we want to be like this, all right? Not like that, okay? All right. Are you ready? One, two, three. But the fruit of the Spirit is... Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is? Isn't it the opposite? No control, self-control. No love, love. Brutal, gentle. Hey, which side are you on or? In the last days, Paul says there will be terrible times. But my encouragement to you and to me is this. Let's behave like Christians. La, huh? So that the world will see that there's something different in our lives. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one Relative, huh? you don't hate, but you relatively hate and love the other. Love God. Devoted to the one, despise the other. Be devoted.
to God because you cannot serve God and money. You cannot means you cannot. Lah. Money is a good servant but a bad master. The third thing that happens in the terrible times in the last days is that as a result of all of this, the dilution and the deficit, a lot of people will leave the church. Don't believe me? Check the West again. We all know churches are being turned into shopping malls and karaoke joints, right or not? There's a great desertion from the church. Jesus himself says in Matthew 25, even the elect will be deceived. So, I am concerned. I'm very concerned. And my prayer is that as many of you as possible, if not all of you, will not desert. Understand? There will be a great desertion in the last days from the church. You heard me talk about two weeks ago when I did 2 Timothy chapter 4 on the Demas disease. You remember? Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I think, don't know, it was something 14 or something like that. Demas has deserted me, left me for the world. The Demas disease. Hear me very well, my friend. Be very, very careful. But the greatest threat is the last one. The fourth thing that happens according to this passage, why? Mark this. Terrible times will happen in the last days and he tells you what the times. And I've just summarized it for you. There's great dilution in our love for Jesus. There is a great deficit in our Christ-like character. There's a great desertion from the church. And there's a great denial of the power of God in our lives. And it's found in this critical verse. In the last days, in the church, Christians will take the form of Christianity, but they do not have the power of God. That's what it says. Read this with me. Church, read with me. This is the word of God. God. I'm so sorry that this is such a solemn message towards the end of the year. You should be joyful, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. But what to do? <laughs> this is the word of God. Amen. Come read this with me. It's okay with you? So read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. 1, 2, 3, loud. 1, 2, 3. Having a form of godliness, but denying his power have nothing to do with them. How is it possible? How is it possible that Christians can be called Christians and yet do not have the backing of God? How could it be? It is possible. They have a form, but no substance. They have a shell, no substance. I talk like a Christian, I move like a Christian, I speak like a Christian, but I'm not a Christian. You know, you, you. I am godly, I talk godly, I speak godly, but I'm not him. And the amazing thing is this, the world sees us through. Do you know that? The world can smell a rat a mile away one. Don't even have to be the Holy Spirit. Huh? I also can smell a rat a mile away. Huh? 
you also can smell the red tamale. Correct or not? Yeah. A form. No substance. That's dangerous. Why? Why is it so dangerous? Believe me now. Listen to me very well now. Why? Now all the rest, I, yeah, okay, la, daily, daily, I read the Bible. La. But this is very dangerous for you. Why? Because when you have the form and you do not have the power and the spiritual authority in your life, what happens is that you allow now evil forces of darkness to come into your life, overpower you because you don't have the power to overcome. You have the form. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Siapa engkau? Does that familiar? Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who are you? Christian, ah? Finish, ah? Now you know why, ah? There is no peace in your heart. There's strife all the time in your family. There is no joy, no peace, no love, which are the ingredients of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace. We sang it in Christmas time. Is it a carol only or what? You open the door for the forces of darkness to wreak havoc in your life, in your family, in your business. And you wonder why? And you wonder why? Because you have a form of godliness, but you do not have the power to fight the evil one. And the evil one comes to kill, steal and destroy and wreak havoc in your family, in your personal life. You have no peace. Absolutely no peace. Believe me, my friend. That's dangerous. So my encouragement to you is this. Stop the rut. Stop the rut. This is the words of God to warn us, warn you, because days will become darker and darker and darker in the coming days. They will not become lighter, understand? It will become more and more sukar, more and more susa, more and more difficult, more and more challenging. So if I were you, I will take stock of where I am today. And that's my encouragement. So you have a form of godliness but you have no power or spiritual authority over the evil one. How do we overcome? How do we overcome? Amazing thing is Paul, very good, you see. First nine verses, he tells you, these are the problems in the world today. And then from verse 10, right to the end of the chapter, Paul tells us three things that you and I can do. Now listen very well to me now. This second half is more important than the first half. Because I want you now to take stock of yourself. Take hold of your life. Put a stop to the rut. Come to a good accurate diagnosis of where you are today in your spiritual health. So number one, how do we overcome and emerge victorious more so now as we come to the close of the year? Let's close the year well. Am I alright? Okay, okay with you? So that we can enter the new year well. So what do we do? So number one, follow good and godly examples. Because Paul writes from verse 10 to verse 12 this. He says, after all the 19 negative things and after all the indictments of what's happening within the church to Christians, he says this, now you know, you, 
However, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, persecutions. Is it not only good things, huh? You will be persecuted. You will be misunderstood. That's, a, that's all in the package. Sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, where he was stoned. Paul was stoned to death. Persecutions that I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being, in other words, you, you, you choose them. Either you go down a spiral downwards, getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, or you put a stop to it and rise up again. You decide. And the first thing you need to do to overcome all this is to follow good examples. It's about a company that you mix with. It's about the people that you partner with. Who are your close friends? Who do you follow as the good examples? Do you have godly men around you that can speak into your life without fear or favor because they love you, not because they want to pander to you? Who do you mix with? Which examples do you follow? Who are your heroes? It's very, very important. Because Paul says in elsewhere, he says this, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. In other words, be in the right company. If you want to follow people, follow godly ones. Don't partner with crooks and cheats. The world mantra is this. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. Huh? You see who deceive each other first? Huh? Who's the better, better deceiver? Who's the, better, who's the worst crook, right? You scratch my back, I scratch your back. I do this for you, do this for me. This is the world. And we get absorbed and submerged into all this and we shun Christian fellows. Now, I'm not saying all Christian fellows are good. You choose, you decide. Paul says, you follow good examples. Imitate me, follow me, you know me, you know me, you know it. Surround yourselves with good godly men that will speak into your life. Correct you, rebuke you. That's, I'm, going, I'm going to that in a short while. In love. Do you have people like that? Because this is the way. The best of men are still men at best. I can fail you. Men can fail you. But we need each other. Amen? We need each other. So who are your friends? Who do you mix with? Who are your partners? You know, in SIBKL, I've come to realize that we have very good people here. Very, very good people. You agree with me? Say amen. Say a loud amen. amen. Yes. I, I'm not boasting, but I am boasting. Why should I boast about my church? We have very good people here. People who are successful. People who are godly, who raise their family well. People who can take authority over their home. Listen to me. If you don't do that, the devil will come in and wreak havoc in your family. You can be the richest man in the world, but what's the point if there's no laughter, no joy, no peace, whole life fight, 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 whole life strive? Listen. I just recently went to a house just about a week or so ago in a, in a cell harvest. And this man was, you know who I'm talking about if you're here. Huge house. And it was so good, he invited all the neighbours to come. All the neighbours around came. A lot of them non-Christians. And the, preach, the word of God was preached, the gospel was shared, testimony, and all in all, the seven salvations that night, you know. Come on, let's give God a clap offering. Shall we do that? Isn't it amazing? 
that all, all the neighbors could come, you know, because he opened the house. But more important than that, when I, when I interacted with this family and the wife and the two, two grown up children, I sense there is peace. I sense there is joy. I sense there is so much love in the church, in that house. And there are many people like that in the church. Mix around with them, lah. What's wrong with you all? You know, there are people who love God. We are not perfect by any measure, but we love God, amen? We love God. Third John chapter 1, chapter 11, verse 12. Paul gives an example of a man called Demetrius. Paul says, dear friend, writing to John, not Paul, Apostle John, all right? Apostle John wrote, third John. Do not imitate what is evil. <laughs> Don't follow what is evil. <laughs> follow what is good. <laughs> if you want to follow somebody, follow people who are good. Don't follow the crooks. Do business with them and then, as I said, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. At the end of the day, end up being enemies. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has, does not seen God. I'm not saying that you don't mix with non I'm not saying that, understand. I'm trying to say who influences you? Who shapes your character? Who affects you most in your behavior, in your conduct? You tell me. You tell God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself. Isn't it amazing? Demetrius is spoken by the truth. We also speak well of him and you know that our testimony is true. There's such a man called Demetrius. Follow him. This is so important for you to surround ourselves with good people who loves God. And before long, you will love God, understand? Before long, you will love God. And you hear me say this many times. If you take care of God's house, God will take care of your house. If you take care of God's house, you may not be as rich as the guy over the road. Who cares? But you will have peace, joy, Laughter, love in your home. Your children will do well and they will marry well. So that as Pastor Lindy says, generations to generations, there will be a God legacy passed down. Amen. Come on, let's give God a good clap offering. Shall we do that? Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we want? Secondly, Paul says, how do we overcome all these terrible times in the last days? He says, secondly, continue to remain steadfast in your faith and convictions. He says in the next verse, verse 14, but as for you, you see, that's what he's telling Timothy. As for you, Timothy, as for you, as for you, do this. As for you, do this now. As for you, Timothy, do this second thing. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Why? Because you know those from whom you learned it from. Faithful men. You know we are speaking the truth. We are not bluffing you. So what do we do? You continue. You continue. You are doing it now. Don't, in other words, don't give up. La. Don't cave in. La. Don't pump chat. La. Just continue. To the very end, you, you, you remembered my message two weeks ago. In the end, what really matters? You remember or not? How we must cross the finish line and cross the finish line well and together. So you continue running. La. Cross every hurdle, remember? Don't trip at the last hurdle. La. You, you, know, you saw the picture or not? You remember the picture I showed you? How this fellow run, 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 run. Uh, how many fellas, you know, the last hurdle, koyak. Don't do that. Don't do that. 
continue in what you have learned and be convicted about. Live decided. Don't live deciding. Meaning, decide right at the beginning. I want to live like that. Don't go through life. I'm not sure. Lah. I'm not sure. I, when you live deciding, the devil will influence you. Correct or not? But when you live decided, you are convinced that this is the truth and the way and the life. I will walk in it. No matter what. So Paul says, don't give up. Persevere. Carry on. Continue in what I have, you have learned and have become convinced of. So everybody say after me, I will not give up. I will continue. I will love the Lord above other loves. I will cross the finish line. Everybody say, I will finish well. Come on, let's give God a clap offering. Amen. Come on, do it. Do it. You say it, you do it. You will continue. You will not give up. You will look towards man. Man will fail you. But God will never fail you. You see? So number one. Follow godly examples. Number two. Continue in your present journey. Don't be diverted. Number three is very important. Can I have the worship team on stage? It's very important. In the remaining verses of this chapter, Paul says, there's one single weapon that you have, the Word of God. Remember, it's a sword of spirit. Remember? The Word of God is a sword. You fight with the Word. So he says, saturate yourself with the Word of God. And that's what he says. And from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures telling Timothy. This is the third way to overcome friends. At the close of 2023, take cognizance. Come back to the magnetic north. If you have deviated, come back again. Love the Lord above all other loves, not among all other loves. But very important, soak and saturate yourself with the Word of God. Be determined in 2024 to read the Bible. It's not enough to come once a week to the church and hear the preaching. Not enough. So Paul says, you have known the Holy Scriptures, Timothy, which are able to make you wise. You will be wise. You will know what to do. You will know what not to do. You will know when to do it. Through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. Why? Why? What is the end product? So that you and me and all of us may be thoroughly equipped for every good work so that we can serve. We can be a channel of blessing. Amen? The key is the Word of God. If I can look for other ways, I will, but I can't. That's what the Bible says. The Word of God doesn't come to you. You have to open the Bible, open your whatever Bibles you have in the electronic Bible, read it. Because all scriptures are God breathed. It is breathed by the breath of God, written by the hands of men. 1,500 years, 40 authors, all say this, the same theme. Isn't it amazing? 
Why? Because it's written by the finger of God. Everything will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Isn't that investment? So if you're wise, you'll invest in the word. 2024, can I encourage you? Spend more time reading the word of God. Read the Word of God, the Bible, at least once through next year. Many of you have not done it. I know. Let's start again. It's okay with you? Let's all start again. 2024. Let's SIBKL resolve that we read the Bible once through in one year. Can we do it? Can we? Can, we, can I hear a loud Amen. One more time, can I hear a loud amen? amen? Balcony, can I hear a loud amen from you? Thank you. Why? Because the Word of God is alive. It's a double-edged sword. It's alive. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. David says, that we this are close. How can a young man keep his ways pure? How can? Young man, how can? Only one way. By living according to the word of God, understand? Come on, young man, young woman. Show us. Amen. Because many older folks uh, need to look at you. Uh, to encourage us. We should be taking the lead, understand? I'm so sorry many of us don't. Forgive us. But for you, be a good example. Read the Word. Amen. Read the Word. So how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your Word. I've hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Old folks, can I encourage you to be a good example to our young people? Is it okay with you? Is it okay with you? Fathers, mothers, you initiate the reading, Bible reading plan, I understand? Don't wait until your small son, hey, daddy, uh, Sunday school teacher say we have to read the word. True, uh, yeah. No. You, you, you are the father. You are the mother. Do that. Take authority, understand? Take authority. David says, Psalm 119105, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a, guide, and a light to my path. And David says, He set forth His word, healed you, and rescued you from the grave. Hallelujah. Isn't it amazing? Come on, let's give God a clap of friction. we do that? Okay. All his but all eyes closed. I've come to the close of my message to you today. So now you look through 2 Timothy chapter 3, it makes sense now. It makes a lot of sense, understand? Don't focus on the negative part, the first half. Focus on the second half. Do three things. Do three things. Number one is to make sure that you follow good examples. Surround yourself with good men that will encourage you they will talk about godly things and not about things of politics. It's important, but I'm not saying it's important. But in your company that you mix with, are you encouraged? Do you talk about the things of God? Secondly, not only surround yourself with good people and follow good examples. You know, the other day I was talking to a tato over lunch. And he said to me, Pastor, I wish I was like you. So what do you mean? You know, he said, oh, Pastor, you're so well respected. People honor you. You help people. You do all that. For me, uh, I, I am uh, quite rich, like he said. But very few people love me, one, you know. Very few people uh, on respect me, one, no. Pastor, I wish I was like you. And I turned to him and said, Tato, you can. How, uh, Pastor, how? Uh? 
I say from now onwards, you reorientate your life, prioritize your time, and put God first. When you begin to put God first and take care of God's house, God will take care of your house. God will use you, Tato, and you will be a channel of blessing to many people, and people will love you because of what you have done for them. I prayed for him. Tears come to his eyes. You can do the same, my friend. Do the same. Live your life and make it count for God. Live your life. Make it count for God. Hallelujah. All his bowed, all eyes closed. I, I can't give you all the call because the space here is limited. If you feel in your spirit that you want to respond to this message at the close of this year, and you want to rededicate your life back again to God, you stand. Let me pray for you. Maybe this year has not been a wonder, good year for you. It's been jaded. There are many things happen that there are attacks in your family, your businesses, your work, I don't know, your health even. But by standing up, you say, Pastor, pray for me because today I want to put a stop to it. I want to stop the rut today. I want to come back to God big time. And not only that, by standing, you say, Pastor, I want to what I call do a replace and remove principle. A remove and replace. I want to read the word. I want to replace the emptiness in my heart with the word of God. Hey, you stand. By standing, you say, Pastor, I'm going now to read the word of God in my life because the word of God brings healing and He will rescue me. He will give me wisdom. If you want to do that, you stand up as well. No one looking around. By standing, you say, committing it to God. God, I want now to read your word. Like Mary, remember? Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus and Jesus said, hey, she has chosen the best thing, the one thing that should never be taken away from her. Do you want that? By standing, you say, Pastor, I want to be like Mary. Sit at the feet of Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to explain to me the God-breathed word of eternal life that I can grow. 2024 will be a wonderful year. So if you want to do that, you stand wherever you are. Let me pray for you as I close. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Ramandara Katara. People are still standing. I'm going to wait for a short while more as I pray. Oh, Ramandara Katara. Share. Those in the balcony as well. Those in the balcony as well. Listen to my friend. It's good to close a year well, you know. It's good to close a year well. It's so good to close a year well. You know, two weeks' time, we're going to close this 2023. By putting your hands in the hands of God, you know that you are safe, understand? You know that you are safe. By standing, you say, Pastor, I want to ready dedicate my life back again to God. And all the negativity I will set aside, I will become more spiritual. I want to have more power so that my family will be well. So that when I pray, when I pray for my family and for my children, God answers my prayer. Amen. It is not functionless. It's not powerless, but it is powerful. It is powerful because God is backing me up. So Father, in Jesus' name, I want to pray for all these dear people standing across the auditorium down here and also in the balcony, across the length and breadth of this auditorium. Even as they rededicate their lives afresh to you once again, even as we close this year, no matter what has happened, Father, we know that there will be a good closure. And we want to close it well. So we enter the new year in two weeks' time well, with you, with you, with you. So that all the 19 things will not be our portion, but all the blessings of the Lord, all the goodness of the Lord shall follow you all the days of your life. Surely, surely, 110%. Tentula, surely, goodness and mercy and love has said will follow you all the days of your life as you dwell, serve, abide in the house of the Lord forever, forever. Live, God. Live for God, my friend. Love Him. Love Him. Love Him. 
You'll never be shortchanged. Believe me, you'll never be shortchanged because God is a good God. He is a good God. He is a good God. Oh, Ramanda Rakata Rashike. Father, I bless all these dear people and those online as well. I bless you, my friend. I bless you in your homes that the love of God will follow you all the days of your life in your work. Whatever you put your hands to, may the Lord bless. May the beauty of the Lord rest upon you. Psalm 90 verse 16 and 17. May the beauty of the Lord rest upon you. May the delight of the Lord, may the May the hesed of the Lord rest upon you. Establish the work of your hands. Yes, yes. Establish the work of your hands so that whatever you put your hands to will succeed for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Oh, Ramandara Katada Shariang Katada Handai. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. My prayer is that we end the year well as we rededicate our lives back again to God. Amen. Come back again come back again to God you've gone away from him love God once again thank you Jesus